Hi, welcome back. So I started this particular video because a lot of my students have asked me, you know, should I do a doctorate or not? All right. And so I thought I would kind of share 10, you know, things to consider before you start your doctorate. Some of these things are kind of negative, so I want you to go into doing a doctorate, you know, wide aperture, know exactly what you're getting out of it. Um, but it's not all negative, right? So there's some positives too. But the first thing you want to consider is what career path will that doctorate give you, right? And what are the pros and cons of that? When I was looking at doing my doctorate, I originally thought I'd do maybe one in international relations or maybe French or maybe German uh, because those are my undergraduate degrees. And then I looked at, uh, you know, at, at what people do with those degrees after they graduate, and you've basically got one of two choices. You teach, you become a professor, and the pay for professors in these fields is quite low. Or, you know, if it's like a foreign language, maybe I could go work for the State Department or, you know, government or something like that. But again, still not, not maybe not the best quality of life, considering that you've got to spend so many years uh, to actually finish that doctorate. So that's part of it, and that's why I chose business as my doctorate. People that are professors of law, medicine, engineering, and business, their pay is basically at least double what you would find in other disciplines. And the reason is, I mean, I think about myself as a business professor. I can consult as well in addition to teaching. So the pay is going to be a little bit elevated to keep me teaching as opposed to going into private industry. And that's why there's this big pay discrepancy. The other thing that you've got to accept is that fundamentally a doctorate is a is designing you to prepare is, or is trying to prepare you for you know a career in research right and that research can be applied in the private industry but ideally you apply it in the university and I reflect upon uh, my first um, day as a PhD student or maybe it's my second day I don't remember but there were four of us in my PhD cohort. And the professor says, so tell me why you decided to start this doctorate. And one guy said, yeah, I'm a, I'm a faculty member in my home country already, and I'm hoping that by getting the doctorate, I can learn better research skills, and I can also advance uh, in my career as an academic. It seemed to be a good answer. Another guy said, you know, I'm here because I'm hoping that having a doctorate will give me a better set of skills that I can use as a consultant. And I remember the professor kind of scowled at him. The third guy said, hey, you know, I'm doing this because I come from a very poor country in Africa, and I'm hoping that I can learn skills here that can help make my country a better place. And I remember that point, that faculty member slams down his hand. He says, no, I am not paying you to be a consultant. I am not paying you to go be a politician in some country I've never heard of. I am paying you to become, to learn, to develop into a researcher. You are expected to pursue a career of research. And so it was my turn. He said, so why are you here? He said, oh, I love research, and I'm hoping to be a, a lifelong researcher. That was obviously the right answer. Uh, pretty hard to answer anything after that little outburst he had, though, right? So you have to accept that you know, as a faculty member, you're going to be basically doing research in your field of study for the rest of your life. You're going to be doing a lot of creative writing, a lot of boring writing, too, but just a lot of fact-finding and then using it to publish papers. All right, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that means uh, later on. But consider the discipline that, uh, of your choice carefully and what kinds of opportunities come with it. The second thing is whether you're doing a PhD or you're an academic, it is lots and lots and lots of reading and writing. Um, you know, every PhD program is different. My own program, we had to take 30, as in 3 zero, 30 hour, again as in 3 zero, seminars. And these things would meet for three hours. Each seminar would meet for three hours, ten times. That's our course session was three hours. And sometimes we would do all 30 hours in one week. So, you know, three hours in the morning, three hours in the afternoon. And for each three-hour session, we would have maybe somewhere between 100 and 150 pages of reading. And it wasn't like a novel or a textbook. It was like really dense academic stuff. So I spent all of my weekends reading I spent, I'd stay up very, very late reading, and at the end of each 30-hour class, I'd have to write a 40-page paper. So you can imagine when you've got a 30-hour session in one week, and then you've got to have a paper at the end, you basically have to start prepping for that class as soon as you get the text, the texts, 
usually we'd get the text like Thursday or Friday before the class would start. And then I would spend like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday reading, trying to get as much of it read as I could. Monday night and Tuesday night, you know, still reading, trying to get all the reading done. And then by Wednesday, I had to start writing my 40 page paper. I mean, it was not, it was not fun. And I don't think there was much of a learning outcome out of this. I think it was really hazing. Now, some of my colleagues in other programs, maybe they have fewer classes, but a lot more reading per class. But it's just a lot of reading and trying to remember stuff. I mean, it's, you've you got to love it. I mean, there's very little in terms of teaching, you know, teaching pedagogical methods or, you know, doing service or anything at a doctor. You're just going to do a lot of reading and a lot of writing in preparation for your defense, or your thesis defense, that is. So you've got to love reading and writing. And number three is that... <clears throat> You know, a lot of people think, oh, well, you know, academics, it's kind of fun, like how relaxed they are. Look at them all at the cafeteria or having a cup of coffee and, you know, chatting about the intellectual curiosities of the world. You know, that's really not what it is at all. I think it, it is a, in many ways, a somewhat lonely career path. Um, you're going to spend a lot of time by yourself reading, writing, and reflecting. A lot of very, very late nights. Uh, I work every single weekend. And that's and I worked every single weekend as a PhD student too. A lot of it is by myself. There's not a lot, there's not as much, you know, fun and interaction as as you might think. Now, kind of on that lonely note, I mean, there's certain times when being an academic is not lonely. And we have in most most academics have conferences at different times of the year. Uh, if you're a business academic, most of the conferences are during the summer. So I get to go to conferences and meet people working on the same things I'm working on and hear presentations and give some presentations and go to workshops. And, you know, I have friends that I only see at conferences because they live, you know, in some other remote corner of the globe. And so those times it's not really lonely. It gives you like a really nice recharge. But when you come back to your own parent institution, probably you're going to be working again by yourself. Maybe you talk to people on the phone or, um, you know, through a webcam or something like that. But for the most part, you're going to be all by yourself. And that's just the nature of this profession. Number four is the time and opportunity cost that you lose because you want to do a PhD. So I was lucky. I finished my doctorate in four years, and that was kind of an exceptionally fast rate. But for some people, you know, that may be five, six, seven, eight years. Every once in a while, there'll be somebody who, you know, takes 10 years to finish their doctorate. And you think about that, even in my case, right? That was four years of my life that I was not, you know, working and earning a normal salary, right? I was by myself working, learning, educating in the hopes that I would get a job at the end of that four years. The other thing you have to think about with a doctorate, if you don't pass your comprehensive, your qualifying exam, you know, different schools call it different things, or if you drop out of the program for some reason, like let's say you stay in for three years and you drop out or you're, you're kicked out, you've got nothing to show for it for the most part. If you pass a qualifying or a comprehensive, maybe get a master's in philosophy or something like that, an MPhil. But for the most part, you know, you're really giving up a lot. You're giving up several productive work years to finish this degree. And if you don't finish it, you've got nothing to show for it. And for all PhD students, that is really, really scary. Um, I laid awake a lot at night as a doctoral student wondering, you know, if and when I was going to defend and would I have a successful defense. It's pretty scary stuff. The other thing you've got to look at, though, that's a positive side, and I looked at this at the time, I was considering either doing an MBA or a JD or a PhD, and I wasn't sure which. Well, an MBA is a really expensive degree. Uh, year per year, that is the most expensive degree you can get. A law school degree costs about the same as an MBA, except it's spread over three years. But, you know, you're looking at probably six figures by the time it's all said and done to get your MBA, a JD, or, or something like that. At least for a PhD, as long as it's at a decent, reputable school, you will not pay tuition at all. You might pay an administrative fee or something like that. Um, in fact, you're generally paid to go to school. You are paid as an employee of the school or as a teaching assistant or something like that. Uh, so we're given scholarships and living stipends. Now, you're not going to get rich being a PhD student, and I'll give an example. When I was doing my doctorate, I was paid... Uh, it was roughly $2,000 a month to be a PhD student. I lived in the dorms um, and everything. So, I mean, I had enough to pay my rent and, you know, I went out to dinner a couple times a week and I was able to afford a trip home every year. 
Um, so I, you know, I wasn't getting rich or anything, but it was enough. Um, however, when I graduated, I had no debt. In fact, I even saved a little bit of money. Um, so that's one of the actual benefits of being a PhD student is you do get paid. Now, if you screw up or you don't finish on time, you generally don't get paid after a certain point. So like I know in my program, I finished in four years, but if you stayed past year five, you either didn't get funding at all, in other words, you didn't get paid anymore, or you um, have to maybe apply for funding. Sometimes funding is available, maybe your advisor has a research budget or something that they can share with you. Um, but that's not guaranteed or anything, it's just something that you may or may not get. And that can be quite scary, especially if you're a foreigner studying in a different country. Like I knew that if I stopped getting paid, then my visa would expire and I'd basically be deported. So no pressure, right? The other thing that you have to remember is that when you do your doctorate, you will be super, super specialized in one itty-bitty little area um, of your discipline. So if you get like a doctorate in, let's say, English, you know, you might be specialized on just Beowulf. You won't know, any, you won't know much about anything else. You know, my doctorate is technically in business administration with a focus in entrepreneurship. I don't know anything about accounting or marketing. I don't want to say no, I don't know anything, but there's, you know, I don't know a lot about accounting, marketing, finance, whatever. People come up to me all the time and say, hey, you know, what's the stock market going to do? Well, I mean, I don't know. I don't do research on the stock market. Everything I know about stocks comes from my knowledge as an investor or a recreational investor. So I don't know. I don't do research in those areas. And if you ask me certain questions, and even in my own field of entrepreneurship, there's a lot of things that I don't read about, I don't study, and I don't know much about. Um, I know like my little window of entrepreneurship, and that's where I do my research. Now, when it comes to teaching, that's a different story. I mean, you know, you should be able to teach any, you know, sub area that's suitable for undergraduates and probably master's students. But when it comes to the, the, the fine research, you're going to know a lot about like this little itty bitty area, right? So you're super, super specialized. The other thing that you got to remember, and this is my own observation, is that in order to graduate, sometimes I feel like you've got to have a job offer in hand. I used to sit through a lot of PhD defenses, and some of them are really good, but then they didn't have a job offer in hand, and they had all these corrections to make. You know, fix this, fix that, and sometimes it would take like a year for them to make all the corrections to their doctorate. People that actually had a letter in the hand usually pass their defenses. Um, because again, a PhD program doesn't want to be in a situation where it's like, well, this person had a good job, but we didn't pass them on our defense, therefore they couldn't get a job as an academic. All right. So have that job in hand before you graduate. The other thing that people you know, misconstrue about you know, doing a PhD or becoming a professor is that teaching is really, you, you'll get very little pedagogical training in your PhD program. You know, I mentioned that I had 30, 30-hour 30 seminars on research, so that's 900 hours, right? I had one six-hour workshop on teaching. Now, most of my teaching, fortunately, comes from my military background, so I had a lot of training there. But no, in terms of what I learned as a PhD student, very little. Now, at our conferences, there may be teaching workshops and things like that to help you learn to be a better teacher. And some universities, uh, like my previous employer, actually had a teaching and learning center that focused on teaching faculty how to be better teachers. Right? That was something that was offered. It wasn't mandatory, but it was offered. But teaching at the end of the day is a very small part of this profession. As uh, one famous academic told me one time, he said, um, bad teaching won't get you fired, but great teaching probably won't get you promoted any faster either. Right? So you've just got to be able to teach good enough. Now, personally, I try to do the best that I can in my classes because I take pride in everything that I do. But that's a personal choice. I've never been pressured like from my boss or anything to be a better teacher because, again, it's not a big part of the profession. It's the research. Now. As a corollary to that, as you start progressing in your career, then you start having to do a lot of administrative stuff. You start sitting on committees, and I'll tell you, sitting on some of these committees, it's as much fun as getting your teeth pulled. I mean, it is an absolute nightmare, right? Um, it's, and what, what are committees for? It's basically running the university, running curriculum design, running, you know, one of the more popular committees in my previous job was the... Uh, I think it was like called Space and Place Committee or something, and they designated like what classrooms could be used for which departments. I mean, you know, not very exciting stuff, but that's something that you have to do as you progress uh, in the career. So, and the other thing is a lot of people say, oh, I want to be a professor because I want to take the summers off. It's not as much time off as you think. Um, again, because of the fact that that research clock is always ticking. 
you know, I, I went home and stayed with my parents for the summer. And the reason that I go home and stay with my parents for the summer is because there is nothing to do in the town where they live except do research and write. And so when I'm off, I'm not at the university, so there's nobody bothering me or anything like that. But I spend day and night reading papers, thinking about them, and then writing my own papers. So yes, it sounds great that, you know, oh, a faculty member, you know, they only teach four classes, so they're only really working for 12 hours. Well, no, that's not really true. They're only teaching in front of you for 12 hours, but they've probably had to do some prep prep work. They've probably had to grade some papers. There's a lot of stuff they probably had to do just to teach. Then they sat on committees. And if they have any spare time at all, then they're focusing on research. And you pressure yourself. That's very much a self-paced kind of thing. But you pressure yourself because you know that when you don't get published, then you get fired, right? Teach, uh, research is fundamentally the tenet of your profession. And in order to get tenure, you've got to have a really attractive research packet. And so that's a tremendous amount of pressure. And in fact, at most institutions, only about one out of three people make tenure. Uh, if they really like you, maybe they give you a couple year extension or maybe they allow your tenure clock to restart or something like that. But probably you're going to get fired and you're going to have to take a job somewhere else and then restart the whole process. Not fun, right? So those are 10 things about doing a PhD I think you should know before you get started. If you, <coughs> if you have any other questions, post it below and I'll, I'll answer. And um, yeah. Hopefully I'll talk to you next time.